Hello, welcome back. Let's continue with section 4.4, graphs and functions. So this section, we're going to add some concepts that we just learned in this chapter, but a lot of it relies on your concepts from your college algebra, what you learned then about graphing functions. So recall, recall what we know about, for example, end behavior of a function, um, even and odd functions, and their symmetry. Also take a moment to think about how you find zeros and how they look on a function, and what you learned about rational functions back in your college algebra days. All right, so we're going to more precisely give a better graph using some concepts we learned in this chapter about maximums, minimums, deriv using derivatives and second derivatives. So here are your guidelines. First, you want to identify the domain or interval of interest. On what interval should the function be graphed? It may be the domain of the function or some subset of the domain. Two, exploit the symmetry. If you know that a symmetry is, is true, then use it to your advantage. Recall even symmetry and odd symmetry. Three, find the first and second derivatives. They are needed to determine the extreme values, concavity, inflection points, and the intervals for which f is increasing or decreasing. Computing derivatives, particularly second derivatives, may not be practical. Some functions may need to be graphed for that complete derivative information. Four, find critical points and possible inflection points. Determine points where f prime of x equals zero meaning your first derivative is set equal to zero or where it may be undefined, and determine the points where your second derivative is equal to zero or undefined. Five, find intervals on which the function is increasing, decreasing, and concave up or down. The first derivative determines the intervals on which the function is increasing or decreasing. The second derivative determines the intervals on which the function is concave up or concave down. So remember, for increasing or decreasing means you're going, you're starting at a point, and if you end in the sense higher, it's increasing. And then if you start a point and you go down, it's decreasing. Concavity, I think of a spoon. You have concave up or concave down. Think of it if you can hold liquid with that or not. Six, identify extreme values and function points. Use either the first or second derivative test to classify the critical points, both x and y coordinates of the mac of maxima, minima, and inflection points are needed for graphing. Seven, locate all asymptotes and determine end behavior. Vertical asymptotes often occur at zero's denominators. Horizontal asymptotes require examining limits where x is approaching infinity from the left or right. These limits determine the end behavior slant asymptotes occur with rational functions and with the degree of the numerator is one more than the degree of your denominator. And recall for slant asymptotes, your remainder creates a linear function and that's where you create your slant asymptote. Eight, find the intercepts. The y-intercept of the graph is found by setting x equal to 0. The x-intercepts are found by solving f of x equal to 0. They are real zeros or roots of f. And if you end up getting an imaginary, remember when you have the square root of a negative, then it's not particularly a point on your function. And that happens sometimes. 9. Choose an appropriate graphing window or an, and plot a graph. Use the results of the previous steps to graph the function. If, you're, if you use graphing software, check for consistency with your analytical work. Is your graph complete? That is, does it show the essential details of the function? And you can use a graphing calculator, but if you don't have one, you can also use um, Desmos. Desmos, I feel like it's really popular now. You can also go to... Uh, Mathematica, 
It's also called Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha isn't free, but it does do some things for free. But Desmos is a good one to use. All right, let's do this one. So there are a lot of steps you're gonna do. I have three examples here. Um, and let's see how much we we can go through without making this video too lengthy. All right, so our first example is to use a graphing guidelines to graph f of x equals x to the third power divided by three minus four x on its domain. So before we start, I wanna do a quick switch. I am going to write my function as one third x cubed minus 400 x. That way, I don't know, it <laughs> makes it easier to look at for me. Okay, so let's determine our domain. So even though we start with one third, we really have a polynomial function. Polynomial functions are continuous, meaning there's no break. So our domain is from negative infinity to infinity. So that's our step one. Identify the domain or your level of interest. Two, exploit the symmetry. So what's cool about symmetry is to find if it's even or odd, for both of them, you plug in negative. Now, your options, Eric, is if you're, if you get the original function back, it's even. If you get the original function back with a negative factor, it's odd. Or it could be neither, which is a possibility. So if we test it, we see that it ends up being odd. We have 1 third to a negative x to the third power minus 400 times negative x. You get negative 1 third x cubed plus 400 x. We factor a negative. And we see that we get back to where we started. It's a negative factored outside of your function. So because of this, we can say it's odd. For our functions, we have symmetry along the line, along the origin. So I think it's y equals negative x. All right. Let's write that down. Symmetric about the origin. All right, next on our list, number three, we have find the first and second derivatives. All right. Find first and second derivatives. And it's helpful that we wrote our, took the time to write our function as this. And using power rule, we can easily find our derivatives. So our derivative, our first one, we bring the three down. So I have three times one third x, three minus one minus 400. So we just get x squared minus 400. Our second derivative, we use power rule as, again. So I have, I bring down the two, and then two minus one gives me one, and constants are zero. So we just get a second derivative of two x. So let's highlight those numbers. We have our first derivative and our second derivative. Next on the list number four, find critical points and inflection points. You find those by setting your derivative equal to zero and solving, and setting your second derivative equal to zero and solving. All right, so number four, critical points. And again, these happen when your derivative is equal to zero or undefined, and points of inflection. These happen when your second derivative is equal to zero. All right, so our first derivative is x squared minus 400. If we factor that, I should have a space for some work. So if I have x squared minus 400, we can use reference to those squares to factor. So I have x plus 20, x minus 20. And so our zeros are, we set that equal to zero, we get negative 20 and 20. Negative 20 and 20. Now from here, we want to see if points along the middle using our derivative are increasing or decreasing. So we have our derivative here, x squared minus 400. If I test, for example, 
If I test zero, you know we get a negative. Zero squared minus 400, negative. If I practice, or if I plug in, for example, negative 21, it's going to be squared, and it's going to be bigger than 400, so we'll get positive. Same thing when I test, for example, 21, we'll get positive. So what does this tell, tell us? It tells us where it's increasing and decreasing. So it says that here, because it's positive, it's going to be increasing. From negative 20 to 20, it's going to be decreasing. And from 20 on, it's going to be increasing. And that's what we get from our first derivative. Now, if you want to erase your testing numbers, you can, just so you don't have extra numbers in between. All right, we're going to do the same thing with the second derivative to find our points of inflection. So again, let's draw a number line using our using our second derivative when it's equal to zero. So our second derivative is two x. So at that equal to zero, we get x is zero. So we only have one point along our, num our number line. So if we plug in, for example, a negative one. 2x times negative 1, I'm sorry, 2 times negative 1, we get negative 2, so it's going to be negative. If I plug in, for example, 1, I'll get 2 times 1, which will be positive. So this tells you, I'm going to erase my testing points. This tells you your points of inflection. So we know we're going to be um, concave up and concave down and where it's going to happen. So because it's a negative, I know it's going to be concave down. Because it's positive, I know it's going to be concave up. Concave up means there's a spoon-like figure. I think I don't think that's a good way to say it. It means you kind of have a dip where you can in your imagine holding holding water. All right, that was step four. Step five. Let's put all of this together. Find the intervals in which the function is increasing, decreasing, and concave up and down. So we're going to list all the critical points together and all the points of inflection together. So I'm going to write it underneath so I have them right above. So the numbers that we stole from our critical points and points of inflection are negative 20, 0, and 20. Now, between each interval, we have a different type of conclusion. And we're going to see what's going to happen for each one. All right. So from negative 20 to the left of negative 20, we know it's going to be increasing. So I'll write a plus. And it's going to be anything from 0 to the left, it's concave down. So I'll write concave down. From the left of zero, so even this is going to be down. Let's do concavity first. And from zero to the right, it's going to be concave up, up, and up. All right, now let's look at where it's increasing and decreasing from our first derivative. Our first derivative says it's increasing from the left of negative 20 between negative 20. So between negative 20 to 20, it's going to be decreasing. So we're going to have negatives for decreasing. And to the left of 20, it's going to be increasing. All right. So let's do a quick sketch of what's going on with our graph. Just want a different color. OK, so here we're seeing where it's increasing or decreasing. And this right here is our concavity. All right, if it's increasing, it means it goes from the from the leftmost point to the rightmost point and goes up. However, it's concave down. So think of it as not being able to hold water. So it goes like this. All right, now from the next one, it's negative. It's decreasing. So from the rightmost point to the leftmost point to the rightmost point, it goes down. And because it's concave down, it can't hold water. Think of it that way. So it goes that way. 
And I'm drawing points because I know concavity and increasing and decreasing can be kind of weird at first, but with practice, it does get better. All right, so here we see that our function is decreasing. So from the leftmost point to the rightmost point, it goes down. And it has concave up, so this one can hold water. So it goes like this. And lastly, we have that it's increasing. So the rightmost, leftmost up, rightmost, sorry, leftmost down, and then it moves rightmost up. It's concave up, so then it can hold water. So it goes like this. So even though we split them up so they're in chunks, we can put them all together to create our function. So that was, all of that was step four. Actually, this last part was step five, putting it all together. All right, let's continue with step six. Find the values of the maximum and the minimums. So maximums and minimums, are found when it's changing from increasing to decreasing. Also, look at your first derivative. So we see that we go from an increasing to decreasing and decreasing to increasing. We're changing twice. We go from increasing to decreasing and decreasing to increasing. So this negative 20 is actually going to be a maximum, and this positive 20 is going to be a minimum. So we have a maximum at x is equal to, what did we say, negative 20. And we have a minimum when x is equal to 20. All right, now take a moment to evaluate those points so that you have actual coordinate points. And I'll do the work for you. Negative 20 gives us, I'm sorry, positive 20 gives us negative 533 and one third. Negative 20 gives us 533 and one third. So we actually have the coordinate points, 20 comma negative 533 and one third, and negative 20 and 533 and one third. So this is telling us a lot. We should be thinking of what our window is. Our Y range, needs to be in the 500s, right? So we want to be careful as to how we label our y's. OK, step seven. So many steps. Localize all asymptotes and determine the end behavior. So this one is about asymptotes and end behavior. All right, well, we don't have to worry about asymptotes for this particular problem, but we do know something about end behavior. This function, let's not forget what our original function is, is 1 third x cubed minus 400x. We have a cubic, and the lean coefficient is positive. So we have an odd function, or a cubic, and your leading coefficient is positive. So we know our end behavior will be something like this. Now, what's happening in between can vary from function to function, but I know my leftmost will point down, and my rightmost will point up. And that's because of the end behavior. Step eight, find your intercepts. And we can find our intercepts just like any other function. So we know our y-intercepts, we get them from letting x be 0. When we let that happen, we get 0, 0. Our x-intercepts, we get them when our y is at equal 0. So we have 0 is equal to x cubed to the, well, 1 third x cubed minus 400x. We can factor x, and we're left with 1 third x squared minus 400. And you can use quadratic formula for that. So we get x is equal to 0, and 1 third x squared minus 400 is equal to 0. Or you can use square root property, right? And you'll get x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1,200.
and x is equal to 0. So we get x is equal to 0, and the square root of 1,200 plus or minus 34.6. So it's telling us that my x is, my highest x value is going to be 34. So we should make sure we get the 30s in our x axis. All right, last bit. Let's put all of this together and graph. Always label your axis, x, y. And we said for our y's, you have to get to 500. All right, so let's do, um, you can do tick marks of 100 or 200. So I went to 600 and I did 100 tick marks. Not that I did specifically 100 tick marks, I did tick marks that are worth a 100. All right, and for my Y's, I'm sorry, for my X's, we need to get to the 30s. So I'm going to go by 10s for my, for my X's. 10, 20, 30, 40. 10, 20, 30, 40. Okay, so let's go ahead and plot for whatever you want to start with. Let's start with the X intercept since we have those handy. I have a y-intercept at 0, 0, which is also an x-intercept. And then we're left with negative 34.6. So we have 30 halfway. That's my negative 34.6 and positive 34.6. Those are my zeros. Okay, now we have our max and our minimums. We have a maximum at negative 20 and a minimum at 20. So at negative 20 is going to be my highest peak and at 20 is going to be my lowest peak. And I know those corresponding values. For negative 20, we have those here. We're going to go up 533 and a third. So this 500, kind of ballpark it. And for the other one, that's 500, a bit lower. Make sure it's at least close to the underneath the 20. OK, now, even just from here, you kind of know what's going on. Now, I know I don't have all of this together because it doesn't fit. But oh, here we go. We know from the leftmost point of 20, it's concave down. So you know that it looks like this. It's concave down and it's increasing. And then from there, we see that we're going to make this other figure. And then we're going to go concave up. concave up, and then we have our end behavior. We know it's going to keep going up, and it's going to keep going down. And once you have that first initial sketch, then maybe you kind of trace over it, make it look nicer, right? So I'm going to do that all again, just so my graph doesn't look like I did it with my left hand or with my toes or I don't know. There we go. That looks slightly better. So I would think this is something you would have been able to do maybe back in college algebra pre-cal. But we use new techniques from our cal calculus knowledge to be able to develop this such function. All right, very lengthy work. Let's go ahead and do one more example. Use graphing guidelines to graph f of x equals x to the 10x to the third power divided by x squared minus 1 on its domain. All right, first we want to talk about the domain. Now, because we have a rational function, we have to find our asymptotes, which is where our denominator is undefined. So we have x squared minus 1, so it equals 0. We get x is equal plus or minus 1. And these are our asymptotes. 
are vertical asymptotes. So because of that, we know those are going to be parts that are excluded from our function. So our domain is actually x such that x cannot equal plus or minus 1. I see your book uses two dots. Other texts, they use a bar. But that's like a such that. You label your, your variable, then your argument. All right. Second, let's talk about symmetry. So we plug in a negative, and we see our results. So I have 10 to the negative x to the third power, negative x squared minus 1. You get negative 10x cubed divided by x minus 1. We can factor a negative, and we're back to our original function. So this one's also odd. All right, 3 are derivatives. All right. For our derivatives, we need to use quotient rule. For the sake of not making the video too long, I'm just going to give you our answer. Our derivative for our first derivative is 10x squared times x squared minus 3 divided by x squared minus 1 squared. All right, for our second derivative, we have 20x times x squared plus 3 divided by x squared minus 1 squared. All right, so that's our derivatives. From our derivatives, we can find our critical points and our points of inflection. All right, so let's first start off with our critical points. For our critical points, that's where our derivative is zero or undefined. So we see our derivative is zero at zero and square root of 3 in our function, right, by setting our numerator equal to 0. Well, if we make a denominator, if we say equal to 0, we multiply the denominator both sides, so our denominator gets taken out of the equation. So we have 10x squared times x squared minus 3 equals 0. We set each equal to 0. We get x equals 0, and x equals plus or minus square root of 3, right? So here are our zeros. For our critical points, we have 0, negative square root of 3, and square root of 3. Now, I want to test points in between to see where they fall. Now, square root of 3, I need to write as a decimal so I can see what I'm working with. So that's 1.7, negative 1.7. All right, so if I test, for example, 1 into your derivative, you see you get a negative. If you test negative 1, you get a negative. If you test, for example, negative 2, you'll get a positive. If you test positive 2, you'll get a positive. And these are your critical points. So where there's a change of critical points, that might be a, a maximum or a minimum. So it seems like we go from positive to negative. So that's creating a maximum. We go from negative to positive. That's the minimum. So it seems like negative square root 3 and square root 3 are a potential maximum and minimum points, possible extrema. Now let's talk about our points of inflection. Points of inflection. All right, so for our points of inflection, that's when our derivative, second derivative, is equal to 0. All right, so for our second derivative, we have our numerator is 20x times x cubed plus x squared plus 3. All right, if I set that equal to 0 and solve, we get an i, so that one doesn't count. 
so we get x equals 0. And it's undefined where our denominator is, well, 0. So we have to consider that too. So for our points of inflection, my points I want to consider are negative 1, 0, and 1. Test points into your function, into your derivative. Maybe it's worth writing down your derivative. But hopefully you have it to where you can see it. So your second derivative was 20x times x squared plus 3 divided by x squared minus 1 cubed. All right, if we test, for example, negative 2, we'll see that we'll get a negative. If I test, for example, negative 1 half, we'll get a positive. If I test positive 1 half, I'll get a negative. And if I test 2, it's a positive. So it's telling me that it's going to be concave down, concave up, concave down, and concave up. And I should have done that for my other function. This is going to tell me it's increasing, it's decreasing, decreasing, and increasing. All right, so that's our step five. Well, step four. Step five is putting this all together. So for step five, let's go ahead and consider both functions to both conclusions together. I think I know when I make it a video too long because I, I can't even spell anymore. I'm so sorry. Okay, so let's put all of these values together. Let's label together our points of inflection and our critical points. So our points we might consider are negative square root of 3, negative 1, 0, square root of 3, and 1. All right, so let's first talk about the concave part. So I know it's going to be... concave based on here. So from negative 1 and to the left of that, it's down. And we, I'm looking at this graph right here. We know between negative 1 and 0, it's going to be up. From 0 to 1, it's going to be down. And then from 1 and on, it's going to be up. All right, let's take a look at maximums from our critical points and minimums from the critical points. We see that from negative 3 to the left, it's increasing. So I'll write plus and minus for that. So increasing or decreasing. From negative 3 to the left, it's positive. And then from negative 3 back to 0, it's decreasing. So negative 3 to 0, that's two parts. And then from 0 to negative 3, it's, I have these wrong, 1, then square root of 3. Then from 0 to square root of 3, it's going to be negative, decreasing. And then from negative 3 on, increasing. All right. Now remember, we have asymptotes at plus and minus 1. So at negative 1 and at positive 1, we have asymptotes. So there's going to be a break in our function. OK, so based on this, I need to come up what's going on with my function. So let me pick a gray color. What's going on in between these values? So for the first one, we see that it's increasing. So meaning from the leftmost point to the next right point, it's going to go up. And it's concave down, meaning it's not going to be like a spoon. It's like an upside down spoon. So we have that. Then we have, it's, con it's let's start with increasing or decreasing. 
It's going up. I obviously can't read signs. It's going down. So from the leftmost point to the rightmost point, it's decreasing. And it's concave down, meaning it can't hold water. That's not really what it means, but that's how I register it. Next we have, again, it's decreasing. So from the leftmost point to the rightmost point, it goes down. But here it's concave up. So we'll have something that looks like that. Here, we see that our function is decreasing and it's concave down. Same thing here. It's decreasing and it's concave down. My notes, I have this as up, which tells me I might have made a mistake when I switch them over, right? Because from negative one on is up, right? I think I have my notes handy. So this one goes. Up and it's decreasing. So like this and the other one, it goes up concave up and it's increasing so it goes like this. So also, those are all the different parts of our function. Our job is to put them all together. Oof, step six. You want to be able to label your maximum and your minimums, right? So we said we have a potential maximum at square root of three and a potential minimum at, or vice versa, minimum at square root of three to maximum at square root of three. So let's find f of square root of three and f of negative square root of three. And I'll do that work for you. Your answer is 15 square root of three and negative 15 square root of three. So these are points in our function. We're going to have square root of 3 and 15 square root of 3, and negative square root of 3 and negative 15 square root of 3. 7. You have to talk about your asymptotes, vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, and your end behavior. All right, so we have asymptotes. We have vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 1. For horizontal asymptotes, there's none. We have a slant asymptote. And you have slant asymptotes when your numerator is one more. The degree of your numerator is one more than the degree of your denominator. And then you go ahead and continue with long division. Once you provide uh, calculate long division, your answer is 10x plus 10x times x squared minus 1. And I think I said that wrong. You don't work with remainder. You work with what you have that is not a remainder, which is 10x. So that means we have a slat asymptote at y equals 10x. You also want to determine your end behavior. And we see from our function that as our limit is approaching negative one, it's going to negative infinity. And as we're approaching one, it's going to infinity, right? Based from our, our critical points, whether it's increasing and decreasing, we see it's gonna go, go on forever in, in your function. All right, last bit, your intercepts. Okay, our intercepts, our y-intercept is zero, 
0, our x-intercept is also 0. Let's go ahead and graph all of this. So we see that our graph, our highest point on our outcome is 15 square root of 3. What is 15 square root of 3? 15 square root of 3 is about 25.9. Okay, so we need to get at least a 30 for our y's. And as for our x-intercepts, we see that, I'm sorry, x-values, they don't really go much higher than like about 2. So let's two, go to 3. So we need to go up to 25. So let's go to 30 for our y's. 1, 2, 3, 30. 1, 2, 3, negative 30. And then 3 for our x's. All right, let's start with our x-intercepts and y-intercepts. Well, that's just zero. Let's label our vertical asymptotes at negative one and at one. Okay, now let's use our concavity and points of inflection to know what's going on. Oh, we also have a slant asymptote, right? We have one at x equals, y equals 10x. So something like this, right? Okay, now we have a minimum and a maximum at square root of 3 and negative square root of 3, which is about 1.7, about negative 1.7, and positive 1.7. I'm just drawing that point where I know I'll have a maximum or a minimum. All right, so we're going to have a break. This is going to be kind of challenging to graph. All right, so we said that we go on from the left, we go down, and then we reach our high point right here, and then down. That's our maximum. And our minimum, we said we're going to go up, concave. I'm looking at this right here. Um, concave up, and then concave down. So something like this, where I reach my minimum and then go back up. All right, and in between, it looks like we're doing like this figure right here, right? So it goes like this. And you know what, it's, it's very forgiving. If you make a slight mistake, you can always take a moment, or if you're unsure, take a moment to go on to decimals and see how it is that we're supposed to do it. And don't be too hard on yourself. If you ever have to graph something as you go on to your math career, you'll learn how to use different types of software to produce what you want. Um, this next example, I'll let you to try it. I don't want to make the video too long. You can go on my math lab and go to your static e-text. If you do, that's in page 232. That's where you can find this example. All right, that's it for 4.4 graphing functions. Thanks.